I know we're leaving out parents, and sometimes parents may get heartburn over it, but I say, you know, just like um, the former principal there at East Met, uh, Mark Nixon, what he said to us when we were leaving Piedmont, he said, I know you all have heard some dastardly things about East Met. He said, but I challenge you to give me a chance. And so, you know, and, and, and I had to think about that, you know, giving my child a chance at East Max when she was starting ninth grade. I, I took him up on that because he had that sincerity. And I think with the things that we're going to find out about our leadership, Blue Beacon, and some of the root causes, I, I want to have a clear picture of what a school's needs are before we just wholesale make that change because we did not serve the needs of the kids that we bust in from the five points area all the way up to Morehead. And I'll say that honestly. I mean, it took three years for us there at Morehead to get the kids to rise to the challenge. Three years. And then I was so tired, I had to find another school. <laughs> all right. Rhonda, do you want to say something to us? Someone else dialed in. Is somebody else online with this besides Paul, Erica, and Rhonda? Uh, Anne is joined. Anne, you're with us. Well, yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, if you want to yes, jump Paul. in too, and when you need to, please let us know that as well. Uh, Rhonda, did you want to say I something? I would appreciate being able to speak to the committee, uh, even though I'm not a member. Please do. Um, it's, I haven't been able to hear all of the comments, but I heard um, part of Tim's and then Amir even. And all I would add is that having been a parent in CMS since 1996, or maybe 90, yeah, 96, um, we were at a neighborhood or at a, at a magnet school called David Talks. David Talks actually is going to be Title I status this year, and it's out in the north of Harris Boulevard. Um, so as Ruby said, and as Mary said, things are changing. Neighborhoods are changing. Um, schools that were once pretty predictable with their population, those are changing. Um, that having been a part of CMS since the days when students spent more, you know, a great deal of time on the bus, segregated in their buses, by the way, because they were coming from neighborhoods. So there were segregated buses, and kids were spending time on transportation instead of education. I, the, the guarantee of a school close to home is a huge factor for the many reasons that Mary mentioned, um, and, and many more. Um, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, which I am entitled to as a, just a person in the world here, um, predictive links that we always talk about, the predictive links for um, less than, than stellar academic success cannot be cured on a school bus. They really can't be cured by a scheme of moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic or the kids around in the system. And to be honest with you, we as a board need to accept at some point that they really can't all be fixed in the six to seven hours a day, that we have supervision and mentoring of those children in school. For some of the reasons that we've looked at programs like Project List and are starting to see some successes in the things they offer, because we must acknowledge that predictive links cannot be fixed in the school house. They need to be fixed in the community, and, and Mary pointed out we need to, and it needs to be fixed, and we need to have the engagement of our entire community, our you know, county social services programs and our state programs. That's the only way to actually fix predictive links. What we can do is try to put band-aids on them and try to minimize or mitigate their impact on academic achievement. The best way to do that is to actually address them head on. And to bus kids all, all around the city isn't addressing those predictive links or any band-aids or, or curative measures that we can put on them. To address them head on is to address them where they're occurring. And to try to do things like Project Lift is doing, which really has, is trying to impact the household and um, making sure that each child has a mentor or a supportive adult to shepherd them through their education and academic journey. So I would just like us as a board, at some point we've got to acknowledge that. Um, predictive links aren't going to be cured on a school bus. School buses are segregated. 
And Mary, I would, I would say that if we decide to go back to a busing scheme student assignment plan, our buses will be the third place that is segregated, church, school, and buses. And um, and that's really it. I, I, I'm happy to be able to join you at least in this manner. Um, I think these are discussions we need to have in front of the public at a board meeting. Um, and um, I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Comments? Any comments or questions, I'm happy to accept. I think one of the things that Tim alluded to when he talked about, um, okay, <laughs> um, Who's speaking, please? Mary, Mary speaking. Um, Thank you. When, I, I, I don't feel like this conversation is about busing per se, uh, I think it has been brought in because a lot of the emails and things that we're getting right now is parents who are neighborhood, I mean community folks who are thinking that we're talking about just topsy-turvy redoing a whole new busing plan. And I don't, I don't think Ruby insinuated that, nor Tim, or Erica, or anyone else. It's just trying to get to a middle ground where all children are given the opportunities that are there. And I look at my time at not only Community House, but also over at um, In Haven. In Haven had a great population of kids, but we also had kids who were from the other spectrum and they were economically disadvantaged. Those children rose to the challenge at In Haven because they assimilated into their peer groups there. And I, I did see that even though they were not from high income households, because they were living in the area, they're off Johnson Road and they were coming into In Haven, they performed. They knew they wanted to keep up. So it does make a difference who your peers are when you're in the classroom. Um, and I'll go back to when we used to do, um, not do the pullouts for uh, kids who were AG. Everybody was in the same classroom. The students who were not identified AG Sometimes they can outperform the AG kids whenever the TD teacher would come into the classroom because they wanted to impress that teacher also. And so I, I think when we have children in classrooms and they are all appearing to be hopeless and then have that bright point or bright points in there that can raise them up with their peers, they're not going to perform. Because if one child acts out, another's going to act out. Because they're going to do the same thing that they're seeing. So somehow or another, I don't care what kind of programs we offer, we've got to have children who are going to take advantage of those programs. And parents that know what the programs are about and can advocate for their children on behalf of those programs. So. Yep. Um, Ruby? And, and I think what you said about teaching parents, valuing parents. Um, yes, some schools are going to do better because they have a high level of participation. Parents trip over themselves getting into the schools. And personally, I've heard some, some principals say sometimes, uh, <laughs> They need to stay home. <laughs> Just say it. But then the PTA, PTO, they raise sixty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. They are, and then that poor school. What do they raise? If, if they if they have a PTA, PTO, they don't have that kind of leadership. So yes, even from the parent perspective, and yes. Uh, busing, buses were segregated. Those segregated buses 
uh, always meant more of a burden on those African American children at the time because they were the ones that took the long bus rides to hit that 30% cap. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, they, they were, and, and that, that, that is a fact. Um, I lived it in, uh, in the classroom and outside of the classroom as well um, uh, here at CMS. So we, let's not absolve ourselves at looking at all this. That's, uh, that's all I'm saying. Uh, and to, uh, to shut down this kind of health discussion um, is important. And, and I, I, I want to make an unrelated remark. But let's look at South Carolina, uh, with the tragedy there. Had the persons not been, uh, uh, with, what's his name, Representative Pinckney that died, that flag would not have been down. The wall would have still, still been up. The horn lady, the representative who was the daughter of a Confederate daughter, so she said a month ago it would not have happened. And she, so it, it took a lot of interacting, uh, me sitting beside a Tom to understand the perspective, uh, uh, perspectives. And you don't get that as long as we stay in these little enclaves, I don't care if you're brown, black, Asian, whatever. Uh, we, we need to find some ways to be a community of learners. I'm not proud of being 50 in the nation at the bottom of what? Open mobility. Quality of life. Quality of life. That should not be something that we are happy with. And schools do have a role in that. We do have a role. But Can I pick the county has a larger role. I'm not down and down you know, they conducted this study and have rolled out, you know, these focus groups. But then when we try present a budget that's going to be best for the students that we're serving what happens to us agree, agree, agree. you know we we have the weight of the world on our shoulders when it comes to our students but we don't have a dime to do anything about that weight that's on our shoulders 